Hello everyone, this is Anirudh from Edureka. In this tutorial, let us talk about deep learning and learn a new deep learning framework called as PyTorch. Guys, let's begin. This is the agenda for this session. First, we'll start by checking out what deep learning is and then we can dive into the frameworks available. Later, let's check out what PyTorch has to offer for us. Then we can compare PyTorch with TensorFlow to check out some of the major differences between both the frameworks. Lastly, let us consider an image classifier use case where we'll construct our own neural network around that and we can summarize the entire thing. First up, so what is deep learning? So guys, deep learning is pretty much simple and I'm pretty sure every one of us have heard of the terms artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Well, artificial intelligence is not new. The term was first coined way back in the year 1956 and the idea was to basically create machines. Machines which have the power to think, machines which have the power to analyze and make decisions all on their own. Well back they did not have enough data or the computation power. But now with big data coming into existence and with the advent of GPUs, artificial intelligence is possible. Well deep learning and machine learning are just the ways to achieve artificial intelligence guys. And let me give you a fun fact. The concepts of deep learning is being implemented right now as you watch this video. How else do you think that YouTube is giving you video recommendations based on what you've been watching? Next, we look at the basics of deep learning. So what is deep learning? Guys, deep learning is a collection of statistical machine learning techniques used to learn feature hierarchies often based on artificial neural networks. Let us consider the diagram on the screen. So here I have for you a basic neural network. Guys, we have one input layer, we have two hidden layers and one output layer. It is to be noted that a neural network can only have one input layer and one output layer followed by any number of hidden layers. This is based on the requirement ranging from one to n number of hidden layers based on the complexity. Usually we limit ourselves to one or two, but you can have any more than that as well. So the data flows from the input layer to the output layers through the hidden layers guys. So what actually happens in the hidden layers are based on the activation function. I'm pretty sure everyone here is aware of the activation functions. We have ReLU, Rectified Linear Unit, we have Linear, we have Sigmoid, etc. guys. And guys, for machine learning and deep learning, we have many in-depth tutorial videos on the channel. I'll leave a link in the description box below and you guys can check it out from there. Next up, let us check out some of the programming languages for neural networks. So basically, multiple languages allow support for working with neural networks. And these are some of them. We have Lisp, which is Lisp processor. We have Prolog, we have R, we have Java. And the personal favorite of everyone who codes with neural networks, Python guys. So for the sake of this tutorial, let us consider Python. So let us check out what Python has to offer for us. What are the libraries Python is providing for us? So in my opinion guys, there are four main deep learning libraries which are found to be most popular and useful. We have Theano, we have TensorFlow, we have Keras and PyTorch. In this tutorial, let us be focusing on PyTorch. So let us begin by checking out what PyTorch actually is. So PyTorch is in my opinion, the new kid in the block. PyTorch is the scientific computing package as we all know it and I'd like to put out some features which I believe stand out. So firstly, PyTorch offers native support for Python and the use of all of its libraries guys. Secondly, it is actively used in the development of Facebook and its subsidiary companies which are working on the similar technologies. PyTorch ensures an easy to use API which ensures easier usability and better understanding while coding. Well, who wouldn't like to have an API and make their lives that much easier guys? Next up, we have dynamic computation graphs. Dynamic computation graphs are the major highlight here guys as they ensure that the graph builds up dynamically. So at every point of code execution, we can actually build the graph as you go along and can be manipulated at runtime based on the needs. And PyTorch is fast guys. PyTorch is definitely really fast and it feels native, hence ensuring easier coding and faster processing. Lastly, we have the support for CUDA. So CUDA is basically Nvidia's brainchild and their native technology. So the support for CUDA ensures that the code can actually run on a graphical processing unit or the graphic card, thereby decreasing the time which is actually needed to run the code, which increases the overall performance of the system. CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture, guys. Now that we've checked out some of the features of PyTorch, let us go ahead by checking out how actually PyTorch came into existence. So basically, PyTorch is a cousin of Lua-based Torch framework. It was actively used in the development of Facebook, as I previously mentioned. Next up, let us check out on how we can install PyTorch. Guys, let me open up my PyCharm and I'll walk you through on how we can actually install the PyTorch framework. So here in my PyCharm, I'll go to File, I'll go to Settings for New Projects, and here I'll go to Project Interpreter. Here we need to click on the little plus icon on the right side and we need to add certain frameworks. So in our case, we'll be using NumPy, 
will require matplotlib and mainly will require the torchvision package so as soon as that has been downloaded and installed all we have to do is click on apply and okay and that's about it guys the frameworks will be ready to use and you can import it and actually start using it so let me go back to my presentation to see what's next next up let us check out some of the major pytorch concepts guys first up we need to know some of the basic terminologies so let us start with tensor so tensor is an imperative n dimensional array running on the gpu we have variable so variables are nodes in computation graph which is used to store the data and the gradients we have modules so basically modules in a neural network layer are used to store states basically states are also called as learnable weights guys let's head back to pycharm and let us check out some of the simple code implementation using pytorch so after the first step of actually installing all the packages we'll be importing the torch package here and firstly let us start by constructing a five cross three matrix which is uninitialized we'll be using torch.empty since it will be an uninitialized matrix and we'll be printing the same so let me go ahead and run this code for you guys and we can check out the implementation of the empty matrix so as you can check out guys from the output we have the empty tensor next up similarly let us consider another five cross three matrix but this time we'll be putting random values into it and we can check out the output so every time you execute this code the new values are generated as you can see we have the tensor output of 5 cross 3 with random values inside it next up let us construct a matrix which is filled with zeros and specifically we'll be mentioning the data type to be long so we'll be using torch.zeros in this case to put a matrix filled with zeros and we'll be explicitly requiring the data type to be long in this case so let me go ahead and print this to check the output as you can see we have the tensor filled with zeros and it is of the data type long next up guys i want you to look closely into the code here we have the dimensions 5.5 and 3 and I'm pretty much you guys guessed it. So that is not dimensions So 5.5 and 3 are actually tensor data and not dimensions So if I go ahead and print this you will actually get the output to be 5.5 and 3 That's about it guys. It is as simple as that Next up we'll actually create a tensor which is based on an existing tensor These methods will reuse all the properties of the input tensor for example the data type or any other dependencies on other packages unless the new values are provided by the user so let us say you don't want to carry the dependency but you want new values or you want to change the data type you will have to explicitly call it in the second tensor if you want to change it so let me go ahead and run this code and we can check it out so here basically we'll be filling a tensor with ones and later we'll be overriding the data type from double to be float so the output we get is basically float data type of the new tensors value as you can see the first tensor is filled with ones and the second tensor is the random values filled with the explicit data type as float so that's the perfect output so i'm pretty sure at this point of time that all of you are actually curious on how we could actually find out the size of a tensor it is pretty much simple guys so we'll have the tensor variable dot size to actually give us that so let me go ahead and run this and we should have the output to be 5 cross 3 yes 5 cross 3 is perfect but as you can see 5 cross 3 is actually a tuple output so basically since it's a tuple it will support all the tuple operations which are there for the case of simplicity guys I've actually considered a few basic tuple operations for you guys we'll start up with addition so here we have constructed another tensor y and we have filled it with random values the dimension is 5 cross 3 as same before let us perform an addition operation and let us print both the tensors as you can see from the output the output is the sum of both the tensors perfect however the same operations can be performed using another syntax which is torch.add it does the exact same thing but this is a simplified version and you can do it in single line so yes as you can see we have the sum output but using a different syntax so guys this is based on personal preference you can pick either one and the output is the same next up let us check out how we can actually reshape the tensor so here we'll be using torch.view to reshape the tensor first we have the random tensor of the dimensions 4 cross 4 and we'll be changing the dimensions of it later we'll be printing the dimensions of all three of the tensors to check it out so as soon as i run this code we can actually check out that the dimensions have been changed as you can see we have changed the dimensions from the previously initialized y tensor and z tensor so as you can see we have the resize tensor as shown in the output so next up let us say we only have one element tensor and we want to get the value of it so by value of it what i actually mean is we have to get a python number output so here let me walk you through the code so x is a new tensor which is a random tensor which is filled with one value so as soon as i go ahead and run this we'll have a random value output which is a singular value as you can see in this case we have minus 1.1957 now if i actually use the dot item operator on our tensor we can actually print it as a python number as you can see that's the output so basically at this point of time we can actually have any python operation on this number and we can actually manipulate the value as well all the manipulations are reflected in the tensor 
Guys, so next up, let us check out what CUDA tensors actually are. To run this piece of code, we'll actually require CUDA in our machine. So CUDA is basically, as I previously mentioned, it is the brainchild of NVIDIA and is the technology supported to use by their graphic cards. So you will require an NVIDIA graphic card to run this piece of code. However, tensors can be moved onto any device from the CPU to the GPU using the dot two method. First, we'll be checking if CUDA is actually available. If CUDA is actually available, then we'll be doing the same tensor operation to that and we'll be moving the tensor to the device. So after that, we'll be printing a sum operation and eventually we'll be printing the output, guys. So all we're doing here is a sum operation, but we're moving the tensor from the CPU to the GPU. Next up, let us actually check out what NumPy is. So let me go ahead and go back to my presentation to check out a little bit about NumPy. The NumPy bridge. Guys, I'm pretty sure we all know what NumPy actually is. NumPy is basically the library for Python programming language which is used to add support for large multidimensional arrays and matrices as we checked out. It is also used as tools to integrate C++ and Fortran code. Again guys, it is to be noted that it is actually used for linear algebra, Fourier transforms and random number capabilities as well. So here on screen, I have for you the basic comparison between running a code on NumPy and running the code on PyTorch. So here we have performed basic multiplication operation as you can check out from line 10. We have the dot operation between two random matrices A and B. This operation takes 350 milliseconds using NumPy. Next up, consider the PyTorch code. Here again, we have two random tensors and we're performing the CUDA operation. So basically, in this case, this piece of code is run on the GPU. Here again, the same thing. We have A and B to be two random tensors and we have the MM operation. Torch.mm basically refers to the matrix multiplication operation between A and B and the result is stored in C. So this takes 0.1 millisecond guys if three lines of code can give you this much of a difference between the execution time imagine what it would do for a thousand or let's say 10,000 lines of code. So in my personal opinion guys I definitely think this breakthrough performance to make use of GPU for execution and I believe this is one of the biggest advantages that PyTorch has to offer for us. So next up let us actually check out a little bit on the memory locations. So guys basically consider the memory location 0x57. So let us say you perform some operation on the data which is stored at this location. So if you're performing a tensor operation which points to this location, so let us say the value was initially 1 and later you did a sum operation and you added 1 to it. So the new value stored at 0x57 now is 2. So let us say if you actually convert it into a NumPy array and you perform some operations on that, so the new year value is actually used. So this is because Torch tensor and the NumPy array will share the same underlying memory location. So once you change one value using one operation, it changes for the next operation. Guys, it is to be noted that converting the Torch tensor to the NumPy array and vice versa is extremely simple. And I'll be walking you through some of the code. So let's head back to PyCharm to check out NumPy. So guys, as I previously mentioned, converting a Torch tensor to a NumPy array is very much simple. Here we have a tensor A filled with ones and of the size 5. So let me go ahead and print this. As you can see, pretty much straightforward. Next up, let us actually convert the tensor into a NumPy array. So B is the NumPy array which we will require and let me go ahead and print it out to get the NumPy output. As you can see, the tensor has been converted into a NumPy array. As simple and straightforward as that, guys. Next up, we need to check how the NumPy array has actually changed in the values. So let me go ahead and add 1 to it and we'll get the output to be 2. As you can check out from the output, we have the tensor output and the NumPy output by adding 1 to all of the elements present in the tensor and the NumPy array. Next up, let us check out how we can convert the NumPy array to a torch tensor. First, we're importing the NumPy package as NP. Then A is an array of five elements filled with ones. And here we're actually converting the NumPy array to the torch tensor considering the parameter to be A. We'll be adding one to the output and we'll be printing the same. So let me go ahead and run this code for you guys and you can check out the output to be two. Perfect. So it's as simple and straightforward as that guys. So let's head back to the presentation to see what's next. So next up, we need to check out the most important thing that PyTorch has to offer for us is the AutoGrad module. So AutoGrad module offers automatic differentiation for us. Firstly, we need to check out how AutoGrad works. So first, we actually record the operations based on the training data set. We replay back all of the values in the data to reduce the losses at every stage. Before this, we need to compute the gradients, guys. So the gradients are actually computed by finding out the negative of the slope and calculating the minima of the trace function of the graph obtained. Guys, I'm pretty sure all of us are familiar with differentiation from our school days or college days. So whatever we did was pretty much simple. However, guys, it is to be noted that automatic differentiation helps us on a big level because the complexity of the differentiation here is extremely vast. So it'll take a really long time to do it manually 
and by doing it automatically we'll be saving a lot of time and it is extremely efficient and so basically this saves time by calculating differentiation of all the parameters at the first pass which is the forward pass itself so next up let us check out a little bit about torch.tensor so torch.tensor is the central class of package and to track all the operations on the tensor we need to have the attribute dot requires underscore grad to be true and next after the computation we need to call the dot backward function i'll be walking you through the basics of this function in the coming slide guys so basically this is done to compute the gradients and i'm pretty sure all of you are curious at this point so after the gradients are computed where are they stored they are stored in the dot grad attribute so any of the operations can be performed on this to update or change the value of the gradients next up we can actually stop tracking history on the tensors guys to do this we'll be calling the detach method and we have another one which does the exact same thing which is torch dot no underscore grad so you can use either of these to actually stop tracking tensor history so however you will require to change the value of the flag in case you need to start tracking history again so guys i hope i was pretty much clear with this if you have any doubts go to the comment section and leave a comment below and we can interact there so next up let us actually check out on how we can create our own neural network guys it is pretty much really simple and straightforward to create a neural network so let me walk you through on how it's done so first to construct the neural network in our case of using pytorch we'll be using the torch.nn package guys so here we'll be defining the modules and automatically differentiate them we'll be using the autograd module for that purpose here we have nn dot modules which has methods and layers guys in the methods we have a method called as forward of input which is used to derive the output here input is the parameter to the forward function so it is pretty much as simple as this using the pytorch package however next let me consider a simple image of a convolution neural network it is also called as a connet or a cnn so in this case it is pretty much as simple as getting the input passing it through the hidden layers and pushing it to the output here we have concepts of subsampling and full connections and gaussian connections i'll be walking you through this in detail in another tutorial but for now let us consider this to be our simple feed forward network guys and next up we need to check out our basic training algorithm so the training algorithm is actually implemented to teach our network to self sustain and learn on its own so firstly here i have a code for you guys so it is a basic code to actually compute the model output in the first line next up we actually calculate the loss using the loss function by passing it two parameters the two parameters are the outputs compared to what labels it is supposed to provide guys next we actually have to optimize the network here what we are actually doing is we'll be clearing previous gradients and we'll be using the latest gradients at all steps this is a very important step as we will not require the previous gradients and it will lead to a lot of ambiguity next up we need to call the backward function to compute the gradients of all the variables with respect to losses and we actually have to reduce the losses at every stage the last step is to actually use the optimizer to perform updates based on the calculated values so guys it is as simple as this we have the inputs we calculate the loss at every stage we back propagate to reduce the loss and we update the parameters however there are three pytorch variables here guys train underscore batch labels underscore batch and output underscore batch i'm pretty sure many of you here are actually coders in tensorflow so guys go to the comment section leave a comment below on how you can actually implement this using tensorflow and if there is any difference and if you find this to be easier than tensorflow so next up let us check out the training procedure for the neural network so the first step is to actually define the actual neural network and then we iterate over the data set then we actually process the input to compute the loss so basically iterating over the data set and processing the input is to ensure that our neural network actually makes sense of the input so at the stage of computing the loss we actually find out how far away our expected output deviates from the actual output next up we need to propagate these gradients back at every stage to ensure that we reduce the losses as we go along as you can see guys this is an iteration process and lastly we need to update the weights guys to update the weights we'll be using something called as sgd or the stochastic gradient descent the formula is pretty much simple and it is as shown guys it is actually calculated by using weight equal to weight minus learning rate followed by multiplied by the value of the gradient i'll be actually walking you through the sgd and the implementation of this in the code section so i think i'm clear with the training procedure for the neural network and let's go ahead before we actually check out some of the code let us recap some of the basic terms guys torch.tensor is the multidimensional array with support for autograd operations like backward we have nn dot module which is a neural network module which is used for encapsulating parameters to move them to the gpu or the cpu and vice versa next up we have nn dot parameter so nn dot parameter is a tensor which is registered as a parameter when assigned as the attribute to that particular module 
next up we have autograd function guys autograd function is actually used to implement the forward and the backward definitions of an autograd operation so guys now let us head back to pycharm to check out some of the simple implementation of how we can actually create our own neural network so guys we are back at pycharm so basically we are importing the torch dot package here and we are defining the architecture of the neural network Firstly, we'll be defining the function called as init where we actually define how many channels will require for the input and the output We have one input channel. We have six input channels and this is basically a five cross five square convolution guys Here we'll be performing an affine operation, which is y equal to wx plus b So guys, let us take a minute off and go back to our school days But I'm sure pretty much all of us have actually calculated slope for a line which is y is equal to mx plus b we are performing the same operation here as I previously mentioned for all of the to find out slope in our graph guys next up We need to actually define the forward function and here we'll be using relu relu is rectified linear unit and the activation function Which is used to define the forward function as I previously explained so next up we need to actually define the nodes So guys as soon as I execute this piece of code the architecture of our neural network is ready So let me go ahead and execute this as you can see we have the output of our convolutions and certain parameters referring to that particular convolution Next up we actually need to define the forward function and the backward function guys guys It is to be noted that you can perform any tensor operations in the forward functions and the gradients are actually computed during the backward function The learnable parameters of any model can be returned using net dot parameters as I've listed here So let me go ahead and print this piece of code for you guys to actually check out what convolution once weight is as you can see six input channels one output channel followed by a five cross five convolution So as you can see guys, this is actually stored in a tuple guys next up Let us actually check out a random 32 cross 32 input here the expected input of this case Let's say le net is 32 cross 32 However to use this net on MNIST data set We need to resize all the images from our data set to be 32 cross 32 So as soon as I go ahead and print this we'll have a tensor output of the size 32 cross 32 as you can see we have the output there guys next up We need to zero the gradient buffers as I previously mentioned We'll zero out the gradients because we will not require the junk value stored in them And we need to use the latest value of the gradients and this needs to be updated for every iteration So let me go ahead and zero out all the gradient buffers while running this piece of code So here as you can check out we have called the backward function and every time we call the backward function the losses are reduced in the network guys so guys, let me take you back for a second and here we have actually tried the random 32 cross 32 input and I mentioned that we actually need to resize the data set to 32 cross 32 guys It is to be noted that torch.nn only supports mini batches of images So the entire torch.nn package only supports inputs that are from the mini batch of samples and not just one single sample Let's say for example nn.com2d in our case here. We have a four dimensional tensor So of n samples followed by n channels and height of width of each channel so here guys it is to be noted that in case if we have one single channel We cannot make use of this because we cannot fill all the parameter values So in this case we'll be using input dot unsqueeze of zero to add a fake batch dimension of our own Next up is exciting guys. So basically this is where we'll be learning about loss function So this is how the loss function works so the loss function takes in a pair of input Which is the output and the target here output means the output which you have actually obtained and target is actually the value Which we need to obtain so here we'll be actually computing the difference between the output we have got and we'll be comparing that with the target What you're supposed to obtain and this actually provides the estimation on how far the actual output is from the target So guys there are different loss functions to be used under the nn package and a simple loss is nn.mse loss Guys mse stands for mean square error and that is what we'll be actually using in this case for us So let us consider a simple dummy target in this case and let us resize that to be of the same size as the output Next up, let us apply MSE dot loss function on it to actually calculate the loss in our case for the random dummy target So the loss function as you can see takes the parameters output and the target So as soon as I go ahead and run this piece of code We'll actually print the loss at that particular instance for the random function So as you can see guys from the output we have the loss to be 0 0.8483 for this particular random case Next up now we need to follow the loss in the backward direction Guys, this is done using the dot grad underscore function attribute where we'll see the graph of computations being calculated for us So whenever we call the loss dot backward the whole graph is differentiated with respect to the loss And all the tensors in the graph that has the flag requires underscore grad to be true will have their dot grad tensor Accumulated with the gradient guys as I previously explained. This is exactly what we'll be doing So for illustration, let us follow a few steps backward 
we'll be using MSE loss we'll be using the linear function and we'll be using the relu to print it out so as soon as I run this code we'll actually have the object printed at that particular location as you can see from the output perfect next up we need to actually backpropagate so as I previously mentioned backpropagation is done to reduce all the losses guys to backpropagate the error all we need to do is we need to call the loss or backward function it is as simple as that here we need to clear the existing gradients else the gradients will be accumulated to the existing gradients which we don't want and now let us actually call the loss or backward function and we can look at convolution once bias gradients before and after the update so let me go ahead and run this code before the update is done and then we can call the backward function to check what changes so here as soon as i run this we need to have a tensor filled with zeros as you can check out from the output perfect now let me go ahead and call the backward function and we can check out convolution once bias after the backward function is called so at this point of time the gradients need to be updated as you can check out from the output we have the gradient value stored in that particular tensor which is perfect guys and the last step as i previously explained is to actually update the weights so in our case as i previously mentioned we'll be using sgd which is stochastic gradient descent and we already walked through the formula to calculate the weight guys this can be implemented using the simple python code First, we need to actually define the learning rate, and in this case, we'll have the learning rate to be 0.01. And all we'll be doing is we'll be running a for loop, which is an iteration where we'll be multiplying the gradient data and the learning rate. Guys, we've only been talking about SGD, but there are many other update rules, such as nestor of SGD, we have Adam, we have RMS prop. To enable all of these and to make use of all of these, we have something called as a torch.optim package that is used to implement all of these methods. It is pretty much simple and straightforward, and let me explain. So basically, we'll be importing the torch.optim package and we'll be creating our own optimizer. We're using SGD for this case and the learning rate is 0.01. So in our training loop, the first step is to actually zero the gradient buffers and we need to define the output. Next up, we need to actually define the loss function and we need to reduce the loss by calling the backward function. The last step is to actually update the value of the gradients by calling the optimizer. So as soon as I execute this, our entire neural network is ready to consider a data set and to be worked on. So guys, I hope I was clear with this basic explanation. So let's get back to the presentation to check what's next. So at this point, we have actually defined what a neural network is. We checked out how we can actually process the input and later end up calling them backwards to check out how the graph is calculated. Next up, we computed the loss. We learned how we can actually reduce the loss and the last step was to update the weights of the network. Guys, next up, we'll actually be considering something very interesting and my personal favorite to be PyTorch versus TensorFlow. So let's have an insight comparing both of the frameworks guys firstly PyTorch offers dynamic computation graphs and tensorflow does not so this is the first advantage of PyTorch when you're comparing it to tensorflow next up PyTorch can make use of standard Python flow control while tensorflow cannot so you need to learn specific tensorflow code for this guys next up PyTorch supports native Python debuggers while tensorflow does not so we can use PDB in the case of PyTorch and we cannot with respect to tensorflow guys and next up we have dynamic inspection of variables and gradients with PyTorch and tensorflow does not support dynamism in this aspect as well lastly guys it is to be noted that PyTorch is mainly used for research at this point of time while tensorflow is actually used in production so PyTorch was the brainchild of Facebook while tensorflow was the brainchild of Google so to all the car fanatics here in my personal opinion I would like to call PyTorch to be BMW while tensorflow to be Mercedes-Benz so one is for performance while the other is for looks and easier riding guys so I hope I was clear with some of the basic five differences guys I'm pretty sure there is a lot more differences here and I'll actually be walking you through the differences between PyTorch and tensorflow in detail in my next video guys at this point of time go to the comment section and leave a comment if you have any additions to make to this we can have a discussion there so next up let us actually check out the use case guys in this case we'll actually be looking at the working and the generation of an image classifier so let me go ahead and give you a good example guys i'm pretty sure all of us have actually used the app which is google translate so the google translate is basically where you can scan an image and you can actually get the textual output from the image how is this done so guys this is done using image to text engine of google this entire engine is based on neural networks and a certain image classifier set. So basically character recognition and image recognition is what we do with the image data set. So let me walk you through on how what we could actually use for data. Guys, standard Python packages can be used to load data into NumPy arrays as I previously mentioned. Then they can be converted into a tensor and vice versa as I told you before. 
So guys, for images, we have packages such as Pillow and OpenCV. For audio, we have packages such as SkyPy and Libroza. However, for text, we can either use raw Python or Cython based loading or NLTK and Spacey are useful as well. Specifically for vision, there is a package called as Torch Vision that has data loaders built in for common data sets. So the common data sets can be Safar 10, Safar 100, ImageNet, MNIST, etc. Guys. So in this case, we'll be using Torch.datasets to actually implement the data transformation in the images. So guys, let us check out our data set. So our data set is Safar 10 in this case. So Safar 10 is basically 100 images as shown. It is divided into 10 classes and each of the classes have 10 images. So as you can see guys, the size is 32 cross 32 pixels of all the classes and the images here. So let's go ahead and we can check out how we can actually implement this. So guys, it is pretty much simple and let me walk you through the entire thing. First, we need to actually pre-process the data set. To do this, we actually load our Safar 10 data set to start out with. Next, we actually read the data set and we normalize the test data set. Guys, by normalizing, we actually convert it into tables such that our neural network can actually understand the data. Next, we need to define the loss function which is used to train the network. So after the network is trained, we need to test the network based on the training data and this is done in the iteration to actually reduce the loss at every stage. So the more number of training steps, the less the loss. And lastly, we'll actually make predictions on the test data set to check how our network actually performed guys. So that's about it and let's check out on how we can actually train our image classifier. So the first step is to actually load and normalize the Safar 10 using torch vision package. And next we actually define the convolution neural network and later we define the loss function and then we train the network on the training data to check out the losses and to reduce the loss based on the same. We test the network based on the training data and lastly we update the weights. So guys, the first step is to actually load and normalize the Safar 10 data set. As I previously mentioned, we already have loaders which are ready and it is pretty much very simple to load Safar 10 using Torch Vision guys. So firstly here we load the data and we normalize the data. As I mentioned by normalizing the data, we actually convert them into tables guys. And this actually becomes the input to our convolution neural net. Next up, we need to actually define the net. So guys, as I previously mentioned, we have three channel images. So what do I mean by three channel images? Guys, it is pretty much very simple and straightforward and it is the three colors due to the usage of color images. And right, you might have guessed at this point that if it is a black and white image, it has only one channel. So that's pretty much it for this step guys. We'll be defining the architecture as I previously explained and we'll be walking through that when I take you through the code section. So next up, we need to actually define the loss function and the optimizer. So guys, here I have for you a case of classification cross entropy loss. For those who aren't aware, guys, cross entropy loss is also called as the log loss, which is basically used to measure the performance of a classification model whose output is a probability value. So guys, going back to our school days for a second, we actually realized the value of probability should be between 0 and 1. So cross entropy loss increases as the predicted probability diverges from the actual label. So what I actually mean by that is basically the difference between the actual value obtained to the actual value what we're supposed to get. So let us consider this case. We're predicting a probability of 0.012 when the actual value is 1. This would definitely be a really bad result and it would result in a really high loss guys. However, the perfect model will always have a log loss of 0. And as I previously mentioned by training the network to reduce the loss, all we do is we actually reduce the loss from a higher value to a lower value guys. So that's about it to actually define the loss function and we'll be updating the values using optimizer as I previously mentioned. So next up we actually train the network. So to train the network the first step is to basically loop over the data iterator and feed the inputs guys. So as soon as the input is fed we'll actually be optimizing it and that's about it. Guys it is as simple as that and you will check out the same when we walk through the code. And the last step is to actually test the network based on the training data. So guys to do this first we need to check out for the changes in the model and next we need to predict an output class label. So after we have predicted the output class label we need to check it against the ground truth. If it is correct we'll add it to the sample of correct predictions and if it is incorrect we need to predict it again by doing another iteration over the same. So guys let's go over through some of the code and we can actually get a better idea of what I've actually explained here. So the first step as I mentioned is actually load and normalize SFR10. So guys as you can check out we're using torch vision package to import our images here. So the first step here is to actually download the SFR10 from their database guys. We need an active internet connection at this point of time and make sure you have that. So at this point of time all we have to do is we need to download the data set and we need to make sure that our network can actually figure out all the classes. So we have defined the classes ranging from plane, car, bird all the way till truck. 
So as soon as I go ahead and implement this piece of code CIFAR 10 should be downloaded on my machine and the classes should be actually identifiable. So this might take about two to five minutes based on your internet speed guys. So as you can see in my case it says files are already downloaded and verified because I've actually run this code. You will need to run this piece of code only once because CIFAR 10 is actually downloaded and caged on your local machine. And hence you don't have to download CIFAR 10 every time you need to execute this piece of code. So guys we've been talking code all this while and we need to start showing images and we need to start making it interactive. So let me go ahead and actually show you some of the basic training images from our data set. Here we're using matplotlib and numpy and we have defined a function I am show. I am show is basically used to map the label and that particular image from our data set. And let us get some of the random training images from our data set and we'll be printing the labels along with them as well. So as soon as I run this piece of code we'll actually have the label output and the images. As you can see guys PyCharm at this point actually detected that it needs to turn its interactive mode on because it will actually be providing us with the output on a separate window. As you can see we have the output guys in this case we've obtained dog bird bird and dog as you can check out from the label output as well. However every time you run this piece of code you will get different labels and different images because we've actually considered a random input. So it is as simple as that guys. So basically we are iterating over our data set using our train loader and we'll be picking out random images from there. Next up is the second step guys. The second step as I previously explained is to actually define the convolution neural network. So the code is pretty much as I explained before guys and we're doing the exact same thing with different dimensions in this case. Here as well it is to be noted that we'll be using ReLU which is rectified linear unit. So as soon as I go ahead and run this piece of code for you guys our basic architecture of our neural network is ready. And that's about it our neural network is actually ready and we'll be using the same 5 cross 5 convolution in this case as well. The third step is to actually define the loss function and the optimizer. So guys as we walk through we'll be using classification cross entropy loss or also called as a log loss and SCD in this case. We have the learning rate to be 0.001 in this particular case. So let's implement our loss function. So as soon as I run this piece of code my loss function and optimizer are defined and ready. So the fourth step is to actually train the network based on the data. So guys here we have the range to be 2. So that means that we'll actually be iterating over our data set twice to actually train our algorithm. So let me go ahead and actually zero the parameter gradients first and we can actually compute the output calculate the loss backward propagate the loss and optimize it. Later we'll actually be printing statistics for every 2000 mini batches and we'll be printing the same. So guys this might take about 5 to 10 minutes based on the performance of your machine and we'll have the output of every 2000 mini batches printed for us. Lastly we'll have the message finished training printed for us when our entire neural network is actually finished training. So guys this might take about 5 minutes and we'll be back after that. So guys that took about 2 minutes for me and we can actually walk through the output. So as you can see for the first iteration for the first 2000 images the loss was actually calculated to be 2.186 which is really high. And the iteration to actually train our data set as you can see at every step is actually reducing the loss. So from 2.186 we went to 1.797 and it kept reducing further until we actually came to 1.239. Guys for our case I do believe that 1.239 is more than sufficient to actually perform detection on our image set. So let's go ahead and check out what the next step is. So the next step is to actually train the network based on the training data. In this case we have only trained the network for two passes and you can do it any number of times you require and at each pass reduces the loss as I previously explained. Now we need to check if our network has actually learned anything. So we can check this by predicting the class label that the neural network outputs and checking it against the ground truth as I previously showed you in the flow diagram. If it is correct we'll be adding it to the list of correct predictions. If it is incorrect we need to train it again. So let me go ahead and print some images to show you what the ground truth actually is followed by the labels and the images of it. So as you can see in this case we have cat ship ship and plane and you can check out the same from the labels as well. Now we need to actually check what our neural network thinks of it. So let's go ahead and print the predicted output followed by the labels of it. As you can see it says frog ship plane and plane. In my personal opinion I think this is good enough but there is a certain aspect of error to this. So guys to be certain about this amount of error we need to actually pass the entire data set to this piece of code to check what our network actually thinks of it. So let me go ahead and print the accuracy of the network for every 10,000 test images to see. I am guessing about 50% for the loss we obtained but let's check it out. So guys the accuracy of the network on the 10,000 test images is 56%. Guys 56% is actually really good for just two passes.
And this actually makes sense instead of randomly predicting our data, right? So lastly, we need to check what are the classes that actually perform really well and what are the classes that actually didn't perform well. So actually to do that we will be iterating over our entire data set and we'll be actually predicting the labels and printing the labels corresponding to that. So let me go ahead and run this and we can actually print the accuracy of all the classes of detect. So let's actually execute this piece of code which prints the accuracy of all of the individual classes. So guys as you can check out the accuracy of detection of the plane is 66% accuracy of detection of the car is 79% so on until horse. This is an extremely decent result for just two passes guys. So let's head back to our presentation to check out what's next. So guys the results the results definitely seemed pretty good and the network actually learned something with just two passes and we already checked on how it actually performs based on the whole training data set. So guys this was the conclusion what we actually obtained while well, the accuracy of the detection for the plane to be 58% and it went all the way till the accuracy of the truck to be 55%. However, the highest performing in our case was the detection of the car which is supposed to be easiest at 78% guys. Guys, so lastly let us run through the entire session in a minute. First we started out by learning what actually deep learning is. Next we actually checked out some of the basic programming languages which provide support to actually learn deep learning. Next we checked out what Python has to offer for us and the libraries of Python. We introduced PyTorch and some of the basic code for the implementation of PyTorch. Next we actually compared PyTorch and TensorFlow and lastly we went over our use case implementation of our Cifar 10 dataset and we printed the result. I hope I was pretty much clear with the explanation of all of the concepts guys and we'll be talking about PyTorch more in the further sessions. So thank you guys this was it for this small session. If you have any queries leave a comment and subscribe to our channel for more information on the latest technologies and the courses offered. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!